Well, today we are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I mean, that's what today's all about. Yeah, he is risen. He, I'm going to just keep saying that until you get it. He is risen. He's alive, right? <clears throat> and so it, it is the this changes everything part of the story. Um, everything in Scripture, and, and you've probably heard me say this before, I've been around for very long, everything in the Old Testament pointed to the cross and the resurrection, and everything in the New Testament points back to the cross and the resurrection. It is the pivotal point that God has created in history for you and I to experience change, the resurrection. His death, which was payment, and his resurrection, which was power, combined together to change our lives. I mean, that's, I mean, that's exciting stuff right there. The resurrection is the fulfillment of God's plan to restore us into relationship with him, to transform us into what we maybe have become without him to who we were created to be with him. That's what the resurrection is all about. In other words, all things become new. The resurrection is a loud statement from heaven that says God can and does make all things new. And many of you here today are here because you know what God can do because he's done it in you, right? Can you just give a big shout for Jesus? Come on. Jesus, he's worthy. He does that in our lives. I don't know about, I'm trying to, come on, come on. You guys get excited here. This is, this is Easter, right? Come on. <clears throat> so the resurrection power of Jesus allows us to have, I was that, but now I'm this story. I used to be, but I'm no longer. I'm changed. I'm, it's new. It's, it's different. It, and it might be something like this. I was guilty, but now I'm forgiven. I was full of shame and I've been washed, right? It could be I was undone and now I'm whole or well. God has restored something. I was blind, but now I see. I mean, I was, I was clueless to what was happening. All of a sudden, my eyes were open, and now I can see clearly. I was lost, but now I am found. I was dead, but now I am alive. You know, I was thinking about my own story. I, I, I didn't grow up in the church. Um, you know, I, as a matter of fact, I can count on one hand the number of times that I went to church before I was 20. I lived in south central Nebraska. It just wasn't part of our lives. I mean, on Sundays, we went to the lake, you know, you know, and when it was not lake time, I don't know what we did. Watch cartoons, ate breakfast. I don't know. I mean, I can't remember. Uh, but it wasn't part of our lives. And as I, as I grew up, I, I got involved in all kinds of stuff at a very young age, drugs and alcohol and, and being sexually active. I mean, just I was just out there as a young man. I didn't know until I was 16 that there was a Savior that stepped into humanity to pay the price of my sin. I had no idea. And at 16, I remember giving my life to the Lord in a campus crusade thing in Colorado in the mountains. It was a powerful moment where I knew that God had encountered me and I was different. I didn't really understand that, but then I didn't really understand the power of the resurrection either about how God would bring me out of some of the, ba the ba past behaviors. So I lived most of my life until I was 20 before I ever stepped into this idea that all things can become new. And see, for many of you here today, you might be here, you've never heard that. That's the first time you've ever heard, wow, Jesus makes all things new? Me? New? Yes, that's what he does. And so it could be your story as well. Now, for us, we've been walking through a key text or coming back to a key text every week during this series, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Here's what it says. It says, anyone, anyone who belongs to Christ is a new person. In other words, if I have an intimate real, living relationship with Jesus, it's new. I mean, I, and, and you, you know that. I mean, it's like, wow, I'm not who I used to be, right? It goes on, and it says, the past is forgotten. Now, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden when you have a relationship with Jesus, all of a sudden you can't remember anything from the day before, right? You're like, what happened? Well, I don't know. Who are you? You know, you, you look at the persons you normally see. That's not what it means. What it means is the attachment and the identity that you had as being one that was separated and guilty of sin and shame and all that junk that goes with it is no longer part of your story. It's been washed. It's been removed in that way. I mean, and so hopefully you still remember that because you can be grateful for what he brought you out of to what he's bringing you into. He goes on. He said, the past is forgotten and everything is, say that last word with me, new. It's new. All things are new. Now, what does that mean, though? What's, what's this verse mean? It's a great resurrection verse, but what does it mean for us today? And I think it implies a, a few things. One is, is the door is open to all of us. 
So if you're here today and you're thinking, yeah, that's good for that person, it's good for that person, that person, but not for me, that's not true. I mean, I'm just going to challenge your thought process here and say, the truth is, is the door is open for you to belong to Christ and have this newness of life in Christ because that's what Jesus does. That's who he is. All right. Here, here's another one is that we all have issues. We all have spiritual issues. We all have a past. We all have. And if you're sitting here going, well, not me, that probably is your issue that you can't accept the fact that you have an issue. All right. I mean, that. That's part of it. But we all have these issues that are part of us. But the last thought is that is implied here is that those things can be changed. Change is possible. So what's the problem? I mean, what's, here, here's what I watch and I see. As a pastor, you know, here we are on Resurrection Sunday. Here we are, Easter. We're celebrating that Jesus paid the price of our sin on the cross amazingly grace. Then three days later, he was rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. There's this life. But somehow, in the middle of all that, we still struggle to make it our own. We still struggle to make it ours. And it becomes maybe a church idea that that I agree with mentally, but it's not something that personally changes who I am as a person. Why? What's the problem? And I think there's two big problems. Let me give them to you real quickly. I think we have an awareness problem. We're just not aware. We're just not aware of maybe the big picture. We're not aware of the condition of our heart. We're not aware of the opportunity. We're not aware of the possibilities. We're just not aware. And, and it's not because maybe we're somebody that's terribly clueless. Maybe nobody's ever told us. Maybe you've never stepped into a service like this and actually heard that you were created for a relationship with a Savior, but there's a brokenness within you that is called sin that Jesus alone can fix on the cross and the power to set you free in the resurrection is all part of that story. Maybe you've never heard that. And so you don't understand maybe your condition or you don't understand the opportunity or you're unaware of the possibilities. Second idea that I think is big as a problem for us is we have an acceptance problem. Don't raise your hands, right? But we have an acceptance problem. We have a hard time fully accepting what maybe somebody else has done for us. We just, we want to earn it, right? I mean, I don't want, you know, how many of you have ever received something they give you, you are like, well, hey, what do I owe you for that? I mean, you know, you can't just say thank you. You can't just receive it fully. You can't just be grateful. And there's this weird thing that we have an acceptance problem and we can't quite do it. And we struggle to fully accept what Jesus has done on the cross for me Maybe we limit it, maybe we neglect it, maybe we even reject it, and we miss out on its full impact on our lives. And again, what I said at the very beginning is true. I believe that Resurrection Sunday is the perfect Sunday to experience the full impact of what Jesus did on the cross and through the resurrection, to experience that. But here's where I think, sadly, some of us are today, is that we might religiously celebrate the cross, but we've never been touched personally by the cross. And we actually might be here, and I, and, and I want to say this as much compassion as, as I can say, is you might actually be here, and it's, it's just something you do, but it's not something you are. And Jesus wants to have a transformation moment for you here today that you would move from going to church, maybe, or maybe agreeing with it mentally, to actually having an impact and change your life. In other words, there's an acceptance that changes everything. So awareness, acceptance... Acceptance embraces Jesus as the only answer and the true answer. So as I began to prepare for today's message, uh, you know, Easter is a, 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 an interesting thing. You know, I mean, obviously we're going to talk about the resurrection. It's going to be woven through everything we talk about today because that's why we're here. We're celebrating that. But I, as I began to think about it, I was drawn to four resurrection stories in the Gospels, four stories, four specific stories. And obviously the biggest story that's in every gospel is the resurrection story of Jesus, where he stepped into humanity, lived 33 and a half years, went to the cross, sacrificially chose, gave his own life on the cross. Three days later, they went to the tomb and it was empty because there was power to resurrect the dead. That's the story. That's the greatest resurrection story. But there's actually three other stories in the gospels where Jesus interacts with people that desperately needed to be resurrected from the dead. They actually had died physically, and Jesus raised them from the dead. There was a, there was a transformation. There was a change that took place. And they would, I was thinking about it in between service, they could have sat around together, the three of them, and say, wow, 
do we have a cool little group here or what? <laughs> We're the only three that we know of that truly have the story. I was really dead, and now I'm alive <laughs> because of Jesus. And so this idea that Jesus was doing it. Now, why would Jesus do miracles? Why would he do the resurrecting of the dead like we're going to talk about today or, or giving sight to the blind or, or, or healing the leopard or, or, you know, the leper, not leopard. That would have been weird. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Anyway, sorry, sorry. Okay, now we're going to have to use the third service for the online. <laughs> no. <clears throat> But so, so maybe it was all, why did he do all that? And often, and here's, here's really a part of the reason. I mean, obviously, his compassion and his desire to see us change. But often Jesus would perform miracles as a demonstration of his desire to see a certain type of change in our lives. In other words, he was giving us a glimpse into the resurrection power purpose. He was giving us a picture not only that he could raise the dead, because he can, not only that he could heal, and he does, but that it was symbolic of the spiritual dynamic that needed to take place in many of us, that our eyes needed to be open, that we needed to be set free from the things that have stained us, you know, the, to be raised, risen from the dead, all those things. And each story gives us a glimpse into the purpose of resurrection. Let me give you the three, all right? The first one is Lazarus. Lazarus uh, is the one, and many of you, how many of you know the story of Lazarus? Yeah, many of you. Okay, you know, and some of you don't. What it is, is it was Mary and Martha's brother who were, were connected with Jesus, and it was kind of friend of Jesus, you know, the kind of thing. He fell sick. They had went to him and said, Jesus, can you come and, and lay hands on Lazarus, and, and he would be healed. And, and he kind of got distracted a little bit, and he didn't get there on time, and he ends up dying. They put him in a tomb. Four days pass, and he shows up, Right? And, and one of the sisters comes up and says, hey, Jesus, if you would have got here a little sooner, <laughs> things could have been different, but you're a little late. He's already in the tomb. And Jesus says, well, let's go see what's going on here. You know, let's, it's no problem. And she says, hey, Jesus, it's been four days. By now, he stinketh. I mean, that's in the scripture, right? And so they get to the tomb, and here's what happens. He, he stands in front of the tomb, verse 43, and says, then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, Come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, so he's like a mummy kind of situation, his face wrapped in a head cloth. And Jesus told him, Unwrap him, and let him go. Let him go. What's the point from that story for us today? And it's very simply this is the resurrection of Jesus brings freedom. It brings freedom. The cross and the resurrection combined together is this powerful freedom moment for all of us from the grips of sin. It allows me the opportunity to become different. I'm no longer enchained or entombed or anything like that. Matter of fact, it's the reason why is because he has authority to do it and he paid the price to do it. That's the reason. But no matter how deep or how long you and I have been entombed in our sin. Jesus has the power and the authority to set you free. That's the truth of the resurrection from this Sunday that we're celebrating. That's one of the big ideas. Lazarus, <laughs> unwrap him, let him go. This freedom idea that Jesus has the power to bring about the breakthrough moment in your life, no matter how deep or how long or how far off track you've gotten in life, Jesus is able to do that. That's the truth. Here's the second story. It's the widow's son. So the story goes something like this. Jesus is going to a little town named Nain. And as he's coming into the little town, the little village, there is a whole crowd of people coming out that are in a funeral procession carrying the widow's son, her only son. It was the only son that she had, right? A widow. So she didn't have anybody else, just her son. And then this is what it says in verse 13. It says, when the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion, which is really good to understand about the Lord. Even in our death situation, <laughs> Jesus is in love with us. Even in our 
upward, up, upside down, backward situation. He's in love with you. So today, if I could say anything as loud and as clear as I can, no matter where you're at, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, where you come from, all these different things, Jesus is madly in love with you. Let it sink in. He is. Yet he had overflowed with compassion. Don't cry, he said. Then he walked over to the coffin and he touched it. And the bearers of the coffin, they stopped. <laughs> Young man, he said, I tell you, get up. There's that authority again. And then the dead boy sat up and began to talk. And I love that because I'm thinking, what did he say? <laughs> and like sits, sits up, you know, Dude, you know, like, I mean, what, what, I, I don't know. I would love to just be in there to hear that conversation. Like, you won't, can't believe what I've seen, or I don't know, whatever. But then the last part of it is very important because it says, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. So what's the point? The point is, is that resurrection of Jesus brings restoration. It restores, specifically relationships. It restores relationships. It, it brings us back together where we have been separated. The cross and the resurrection are the opportunity for us to be united back together. And it's twofold. It's twofold. One, it's vertical, and that's the most important one. It's vertical in the sense that you and I, because of our sin, because of our death, because of the situation, the issue, the past, whatever you want to call it, because of who we are and what we have, we've been separated from God. But Jesus, through the cross and the resurrection, reaches out and allows us to be restored with him in relationship. Now, here's where the cool thing happens, though. All of a sudden, then, <laughs> I begin to have right relationship with the people around me. In other words, the relationships that I have horizontally begin to improve dramatically because my vertical relationship was restored in the first place. Here's, here's the point that you could take from this. Many of us struggle in our horizontal relationships because we've never given attention to the vertical relationship that we desperately need. And so Jesus is the one that restores that relationship. Okay? So those are the first two. Now, the third one I want to spend a little bit more time on, and that's Jairus' daughter. Jairus' daughter, it's found in Mark 5 and a couple other gospels as well. <clears throat> but Mark 5, verses 22 and 23, and then verses 35 through 42. And then here's what it says. Let's just jump right in. It says, then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. And so what was happening was Jesus was doing his thing, and he was touching people's lives, and things were happening. The resurrection power was walking the earth and touching people, all right? Things were happening. And Jairus heard about that and knew that his daughter was sick. And as the religious leader, religious, he decided, I need to go and meet with Jesus. I need desperately to get out of my religious setting and get into my relational setting and meet the guy that can change everything. That's what I need. I need to have an encounter with the resurrection, right? You didn't even know about maybe that part of it yet. So it goes on. It says, when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He fell at his feet. I think maybe he realized he had an awareness of who Jesus really was. Maybe he had an awareness of the condition of his own soul. Maybe he had an awareness that, wow, I'm a mess. Jesus is holy. Jesus is powerful. And he did what was right in the moment, and he fell before the Lord, right? goes on. He says, pleading. He fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. My daughter is dying. He's pleading. There was this desperateness about his situation. And he said, please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. I mean, it's a real powerful moment. I mean, just this little couple of verses. I mean, there's this transition, this movement, if you will, this, this change that was happening in him as the dad of this young girl. There was something stirring. There was something happening. And maybe you're even here today and something's stirring. You don't even know what it is. You're like, wow, what, what, I'm feeling something. And he moved towards Jesus, and I believe that it was because he had a desperate awareness, and there was acceptance in his heart that knew that Jesus could fix this, that Jesus could change it, the, that somehow the resurrection power of who Jesus was, didn't even know that yet, <laughs> maybe he heard, heard it being, being said before that Jesus said, I am the resurrection alive, I don't know, but he knew, 
All right, so that's going on. Then we have a little break in the, in the story. And the little break in the story is actually Jesus is in this crowd and all these people are gathered around and it says that there was one woman and she moves her way through the crowd and she gets up and she finally touches the hem of Jesus' garment. And in the midst of that moment of touching the garment, she's instantly healed of her sickness. It's a, it's a powerful moment. Again, Jesus, right? Resurrection and a power. So Jesus has this conversation, who touched me, and all this kind of stuff. They go around, and he deals with her. And then we pick the story back up in verse 35. It says, while he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, your daughter is dead. Your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. It's over. But Jesus over, overheard them and said to Jairus, again, Jesus is interested in your life. He's interested in your story. He's interested in your pain. He's interested in your situation. Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just have faith. Then Jesus stopped the crowd. <laughs> stopped the crowd because everybody's like, hey, Jesus is going to do something. It's like, they were like looking for the show, you know, the, the latest Avengers, the end game, right? Did I hear somebody say, praise the Lord? I thought I heard some. <laughs> well, I guess. Uh, yeah, all right. Um, and so he, he, he stops the crowd, and he wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John, his, his close circle, the brother James. Now, let me just point out something about this. If you want to experience the resurrection power, begin to surround yourself with resurrected-minded people. Begin to understand that there are people in your world that maybe they don't have a clue who or what. They're unaware, but you're aware. All of a sudden, you're, whoa, 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 Jesus can change things. Surround yourself. It goes on. It said, when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. I mean, it was chaotic. It was desperation. It was pain. It was, it was emotional. It was, I mean, all these things were happening. He went inside and asked, why all this commotion and weeping? So Jesus was able to see it from the eyes of the resurrection. He was able to see it differently. He said, the child isn't dead. She's only asleep. And again, it's not over. <laughs> it's not over. And the crowd laughed at him. But he made them all leave. And he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha Kom, which means, little girl, get up. Little girl, get up. And the girl, who was 12 years old, immediately stood up and walked around. And I love this last little phrase. It always makes me laugh. <laughs> and they were overwhelmed and totally amazed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? And there was this girl that had died. Here's the story. So really, what I want to give you and us today is how do, I, how do I find and experience being made alive with this resurrection power? How, how do I make it be more than just a story that I heard on Easter Sunday and it becomes my story? How, how do I encounter this Jesus that we're all celebrating today beyond the religious thing. How do I have that Jarius moment where I stepped out of the synagogue, so to speak, and I stepped into an encounter? How do I do that? Let me just give you six things today, all right? Real quickly. The resurrection power is being made alive. Being made alive is the answer to our hopelessness. I've got to know that first and foremost. That's where it starts. I got to start with this idea that I understand if I'm going to experience the resurrection, I have to know that the answer is the resurrector. <laughs> He's the one that makes it happen. Notice what they said. Your daughter is dead. There's no use in troubling your teacher now. Pfft, there is no answer. Everybody go home. It's over. Not with Jesus. See, for many of us, we are at the end of our rope and we feel as though it is beyond repair and in the natural, it can look or seem or feel hopeless, but with Jesus, the resurrection, anything is possible. There is a hope that transcends our hopelessness. 
There is something in Jesus that goes beyond it's over to Jesus saying, no, it's not over. She's just sleeping. Your life is not over. It isn't ending. It's not hopeless. It's hopeful with him in the picture. The answer to our hopelessness is Jesus. That's the first one. Being made alive, second one, is activated by faith. It says, don't be afraid. Just have faith. Don't be afraid. Just have faith. How many of you are like me that sometimes you major in fear? Just me? Okay, there you go. I knew you were afraid to raise your hand. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> right. I mean, I, I think many times what happens is God is, is laying before this, before us, all these great opportunities, great possibilities, and the faith is reaching out and trusting him to actually make it happen. But fear goes, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't. I can't. I can't. It'll never happen. I... And we pull away in fear and we miss out in the resurrection. See, fear activates the resurrection. It's the activation of what needs to happen. Way too many never experience being made alive because simply we're just full of fear. And fear is canceling out the power and the possibility of faith. So I believe. Jesus, I believe. The mom, the dad, I believe. I mean, obviously for them, they, they wanted to believe. And for the, the apostles that were with him, Peter and John, they, they believed because they'd seen it before. They knew, God, you could do this. There was faith in that room. Here's the next one. Is being made alive brings calm to our chaos. You know, a lot of times we have things that happen that shake up our lives. You know those little snow globe things? You know, you shake them up, shake them up, the snow globe thing. I remember having that happen when our daughter years ago, our oldest daughter passed away. And I remember it was just constantly chaotic, constantly chaotic. The globe would never settle. The globe would never settle. You know what the difference was that settled it finally? <laughs> it wasn't my ability to stop it because I couldn't stop it. It wasn't that I finally figured out some magical formula that stopped it. You know what it was finally? Is I finally came to the point where I said, Lord, here it is. And I gave it to Jesus. In an instant, he stopped it. And he calmed the chaos that was within me. He would calm the chaos. I'm thinking another way. When I was first giving our lives to the Lord, Jennifer and I, first year, I mentioned it, 35 years of marriage, 34 years pretty good, <laughs> and one year not so. That first year was chaotic. But when Jesus stepped in, it became calm. In a moment, it changed. In a moment, all the craziness, all the chaos, not that it became super easy and life was, you know, walking on flower beds and all that. kind. Of, I mean, it, it was different because there was one in the story now that was able to calm the storms. Notice what it said. Jesus saw much commotion, weeping, welling. Resurrection power brings peace. And maybe today the chaos in your life is because of the absence of Jesus in you. Here's, a, here's the next one. Being made alive is experienced by those who fully embrace Jesus. If you write off Jesus, there's a very good chance you'll miss out on the power of Jesus. If you write off Jesus, there's a very good chance you'll miss the power of Jesus. The crowd laughed at him, and notice what he did. He made them all leave. The crowd laughed at him, and he made them all leave. So when I read that, I'm like, whoa, Lord, help me to not be in a place where I'm, I'm mocking or making fun of or making light of what you and you alone can do. Lord, help me never to be in that place. Next one, number, what is it, four or five? Being made alive changes the brokenness within. He said, little girl, get up. Little girl, get up. I've been drawn again and again back to this phrase today because I think this phrase is a resurrection phrase for us today. Little girl, get up. Little boy, get up. Let me explain it this way. That Jesus, full of compassion and power, is able to lift us up out of the mess we are in. 
Let me say it to all of us here in a different way. There is a little girl and or a little boy in all of us that is messed up and we need Jesus to lift us up. Many of us have had something happen when we were young that brought about a death in us that unless Jesus touches us and takes our hand, we remain dead. There are those of you in this room, and why is it 12? Why is it 12? I think that's important. Did you know that 12 is kind of the recognized, understandable time in life when you become accountable for your own decisions? That's kind of a kind of a truth there. I mean, it can happen a little earlier, but typically around that time. I think a lot of us in this place, that there was probably events and situations and moments in your early years where you made some choices or you had some things happen or whatever it might be, and all of a sudden, the shame, the guilt, the death came alive. And maybe now you're in your 20s, and you're older, but that thing is still in you. Maybe you're in your 30s, you're older, but it's still in you. Maybe you're in your 50s. I actually had a conversation not too long ago. I was talking with a guy almost 60, I think he is. Maybe, I don't know how old he was. And I could tell when I was talking to him that there was a wounded, hurting, 12-year-old little boy that Jesus needed to reach his hand out and touch if he just allowed him. thinking about in my own life. When I was 12 or thereabouts is when I began to make crazy choices that led to death in me, that led to death. Jesus speaks to each and every one of us in this room. Little boy, little girl, get up. He reaches his hand. He touches your hand. You have to just accept it. I mean, she didn't have to do a whole lot because she was dead in that situation, but for us, it's just accepting it, right? Let me close with the last one. (laughs) I tricked you. There's five resurrection stories in the Gospels. Nobody cares. All right. (laughs) You know what it is? The three that we talked about, Jesus and ours. Our story. Our story is that other resurrection story in the gospel, and we all need to experience the made alive life moment with Christ, and Jesus can change who I am right now. Here's the being made alive thought. Being made alive by Christ is a necessary spiritual transition. Necessary spiritual transition. John 3.3, 3, it says this. I was, I, Jesus speaking to Nicodemus, I can guarantee you this truth. No one can see God's kingdom without being born from above. The old version is born again. Made alive. It's necessary. It's spiritual. It's a transition here. It's necessary because without an inward resurrection, I cannot experience the God thing that I was created for. It's necessary. I can't get there from here unless God does something. It's spiritual in the sense that it's not something I can do myself. Only God can change the condition of my soul. <laughs> Last week, my, my granddaughter, Loxley, who's three, is she three or four? Four, thank you. She aged since, since I first. And they came home uh, from a church thing, and they were singing a song about how God is the only one that can change and make butterflies. Check this out. We re- actually recorded it. But
when she sung that, immediately I thought of this point in, in the message. God's got to do it. The transformation that I desperately need in my life happens only when the Lord himself touches me. I allow him to do that. I accept that. I make make myself available for that. And then the transition is simply this. Being made alive in Christ opens the door for the transition from the old life of sin to a new life of Christ. Things like instead of being distant distance from God to intimacy with God. Instead of being in a life of slavery to sin, I'm free from sin. Instead of living a life of chaos, I have calm. I mean, it's all those things. So I want to I want to walk through the response cards. Would you pull that out? Remember I told you about this? Pull it out real quick. Just about to. So at the end of the service, we're going to have everybody, and this is everybody. This is the only time we do this during the year. Everybody fill out the response card. Everybody, you're actually helping us to be more uh, effective in how we do things. There's a survey on here and all that kind of stuff. On the one side, obviously, place for your name and all that good stuff. If you want to be baptized, which is going to come up here just in a couple weeks, a prayer request, all that good stuff. But on the back, 2019 annual survey, you know, how'd you end up here, right? Top three things that you'd like to learn about. What, If we added a service, when would you like to see that happen? And then the ABCD. ABCD. And I want you to reflect upon your own spiritual heart and where you're at today, honestly. All right? A stands for I'm already in a real, obedient, intimate, connected relationship with Jesus. My life is Jesus's. I'm already there. I mean, I've, I've given him, I, I live for him, I, I died for him. I'm, I'm, I'm already there. I'm already there. That's you. Okay? B. Maybe today as we're talking, you're realizing, wow, I've got that 12-year-old death thing you're talking about, and I need to be accepting fully of the grace and the love and the mercy that's in the cross and the power that's in the resurrection for my life. I trust him today. I give my life to Jesus. I'm beginning my faith journey with Jesus right now. Check. That's me. And see, maybe you are here today, but you're just you're curious. You're considering see, considering maybe Jesus does have a plan and a purpose for my life that's better than my own. That's just where you're at. And maybe the last one, you you just have no desire right now to make a decision at all. There's just nothing stirring right now. Would you reflect and actually check the right box? I want to pray for each one of you. The worship team is going to come as I pray. Lord, I pray for each one of these groups of people that are in this room right now. I pray for those, Lord, that are already in an intimate, obedient, real, living, alive relationship with you. Lord, they would never take it for granted. That, Lord, they would never get tired of praising you or serving you or loving you or responding with gratitude before your throne. Lord, may it always be just like the first day. Lord, let it be so. Lord, I pray for those that are beginning right now, and I pray a prayer with them. Lord, admitting, Lord, I'm a sinner. I've got issues. I've got things in my heart that only you can wipe clean. And I reach my hand out as you reach your hand out to me to receive what you're offering on the cross, not because I deserve it or I've earned it or because I'm good enough, but simply because you love me and you want to resurrect my life. I receive it. For those that are curious, that, Lord, you would begin to just stir and answer some of the questions in their hearts. For those that are not willing to make a decision today, that somehow, Lord, you would crack the door. That they might see you in ways that they didn't even know were possible. In Jesus' name.